apartment. And uh, so Blanca Diaz is a queer non-binary herbalist who fell in love with native plants through the relationship building and reclamation of traditional knowledge and plant medicine. Through their plant studies, Blanca found themselves outdoors and with opportunities to tend to native plant restoration projects. Eight years later, or eight plus years later, Blanca tends to Willow Springs and guides crew members, volunteers, and community through relationship building with the active 14 acres of native plant habitat. And Larry Rich, so they're, they're gonna co-host this. Uh, Larry Rich has worked for the city of Long Beach since 1991 when he started as an intern in the Economic Development Bureau. He is now the sustainability coordinator in the Office of Sustainability. Prior to coming to the Office of Sustainability, Larry worked in the Department of Development Services as a planner in the Long Range Planning Division. The Long Range Planning, Larry uh, participated in the development of the Long Beach 2030 Plan, the creation of green building standards for both municipal and private development projects, and the adoption of the city's construction and demolition debris recycling program. Larry also had the responsibility of monitoring and analyzing population and demographic trends within the city of Long Beach using U.S. Census Bureau data and the state and regional sources. Larry has a strong background in using GIS, as we will see, and a, um, which is a powerful tool for demographic and spatial, spatial analysis. So both have a great background here. We're privileged to have you. Uh, so welcome to you both, and thanks for joining us. Uh, I think Larry will be presenting first. Hey everybody, I'm going to be presenting first, but I'm going to throw it to Blanca uh, for a land acknowledgement. Thank you, Larry. Um, so I would like to just take a moment um, from wherever direction it is that you are coming from to acknowledge that we are on indigenous land. We here in Long Beach are on Tongva land and we share gratitude to the ancestors and to the descendants of the land that we tend to daily here at Long Beach or at Willow Springs. Um, also be mindful that our water travels from many indigenous communities as well, um, depending on where we are. So acknowledging those indigenous communities as well during uh, this presentation. Um, be aware whose indigenous land you are on, speak their name, honor the ancestors and the descendants who are still very much so actively protecting um, open space, native plants, and also cultural sites. So thank you. Thank you, Blanca. Um, so I'm gonna jump right into sharing my screen. Let's see if that'll work. Okay, does everybody see a aerial photograph of, um, well, I know it's Long Beach. Can you tell it's Long Beach? Yes. Okay, great. So thanks for the introduction, Chris. Um, as Chris said, I am the sustainability coordinator for the city of Long Beach, but I've had a 30 year career now uh, at the city and in some of my previous uh, lives at the city, I was a, a GIS specialist. And so the presentation that I'm going to give tonight is actually a live demonstration of GIS. So this is a, a, a view of the GIS program. So I'm not going to be, do, be doing slides. I'm going to be zooming in and panning around and changing layers and showing you what GIS is all about. Uh, 20 years ago, this was a really unique thing. You know, it was actually hard to see an aerial photograph of the city. Now it's commonplace because of Google Maps. So people are, are pretty used to this. And a lot of the information that I'm going to share is unique, but uh, more and more it's becoming available on, on the internet. And I will uh, share a link at one point um, where you can do some of this um, historic map comparison that I'm going to be doing uh, yourself for all around the country. So when I give this presentation, I can take up to two hours giving the spatial history of Long Beach in minute detail. I've only got about 30 minutes, so I'm going to be uh, going pretty quickly and um, getting us to Willow Springs, which is uh, the purpose of the talk. But I'm wanting to provide a broader context uh, for Willow Springs, because hopefully if folks can join us uh, for the site visit on June 19th, 
which I highly recommend. Um, you know, there's no substitute for being there. This background story will help you put the site of Willow Springs into a greater context and help you also to think about other uh, native plant restoration sites throughout the region and how you could do a similar uh, deep dive into the context and the spatial history of the site. So with that, I'm gonna jump right into, um, you know, here we're looking at uh, modern day Long Beach, or at least in 2010, where the dominant thing that you see is urbanization, buildings, streets, you know, even large warehouse buildings. And you can see very little open space, although you can see the largest bits of open space. For example, El Dorado Park in East Long Beach and Recreation Park. And mostly what you're seeing, uh, interestingly enough, the, these large parks, most of them are golf courses. So we're actually seeing a lot of golf course when we uh, see this open space. So it's nice of the golf courses to hold the land for us until we get around to uh, restoring them to native landscapes, um, hopefully soon. Um, so Willow Springs is hidden away in this map and uh, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna get there, but first I'm gonna do uh, this special time machine routine um, where to understand what the landscape below this urbanized Long Beach was like, we have access to one of the earliest accurate maps um, that is so accurate that it can be uh, uh, geo-referenced with this mod modern aerial photograph. And so it's an image, a uh, map image that was made in 1896 um, by the US Geological Survey. And they actually made maps like this for all of Southern California. Um, and I'm gonna start on the left here. And this is the time machine uh, where we peel away 150 years of urbanization and see uh, what the land was like um, before we got all of this concrete and buildings. And so I'm gonna call out some natural features um, as I do this reveal. Um, and so, you know, down in the lower left, you can see the Long Beach Harbor, but as I pull this back, what's being revealed is a vast coastal estuary of the Los Angeles River. You can also see some lakes, um, you know, here is refineries, um, but in 1896, there were the Watson Lakes. And then, you know, over to the right, you can see the, the straight concrete channel of the Los Angeles River, but uh, I just rolled over the former uh, channel, natural channel of the uh, Los Angeles River. And I'm going over West Long Beach, the little specks that you see. Uh, along the roadways are individual buildings. And in this area of West Long Beach, they were probably farmhouses on the rich bottomland agricultural area that once existed there. I'm about to roll over the modern channel of uh, the Los Angeles River, which was nowhere to be seen in 1896. But instead, there's a secondary channel uh, called a, a name long forgotten called the Cerritos Slough, which is probably a former channel of the Los Angeles River that got bypassed and became a slow moving slough. And then the, you know, the white outline on the aerial is a uh, city boundary outline. So we're about to roll over the city of Signal Hill where Willow Springs is tucked away inside of even though it's uh, part of Long Beach. But you're gonna start to see the brown squiggly lines of um, that represent elevation contours and so as we go over the top of uh, Signal Hill, you can see that dense cluster of brown squiggly lines that represent it's about 360 degree uh, elevation above sea level. And then um, more lakes and streams and waterways are being revealed. Um, down here, uh, we're about to roll over, call, see the wishbone shape, shape of Colorado Lagoon. Colorado Lagoon was just one projection of the vast Alamitas Bay wetlands and estuary of the San Gabriel River, uh, of which we have um, a tiny remnant um, what, that would be the subject of a, a different presentation. And then the um, land that we're about to roll over that is now the um, El Dorado Park is where the squiggly San Gabriel River uh, stream was that shows called a braided stream when um, when it breaks into different branches and has many different islands and stuff like that. So in 1896, when this map is from, there wasn't a lot of um, changes to the land, drastic changes that would appear on a map at this scale 
you know, they hadn't yet channelized the rivers, you know, cities were starting to be laid out, but there are towns. So we can see downtown, what's now downtown Long Beach was the entirety of the town of Long Beach with less than 3000 people living in it. And, you know, the detail on this is such that, as I mentioned, you can see individual buildings at this uh, scale. And so I'm gonna uh, turn off this modern layer and um, call out some of these uh, features again. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this map before, I will uh, show you how to find it for yourself. Um, and, and as I mentioned, uh, a map of this time period exists for all of Southern California. Um, but real quickly, you know, the, to orient yourself down here at the shoreline is the San Pedro Bay that um, is this, you know, smooth crescent shape uh, before it got all the fill and projections that the harbor created. I mentioned the coastal estuaries, the, you know, thousands and thousands of acres of coastal wetland, the old rivers, uh, Los Angeles on, on the left and the San Gabriel on the right. Although those were just those pos their positions in 1896, and they actually flowed in many different places. Uh, arguably, every different place in the LA Basin saw these rivers because the rivers are what built the land. The Cerrito Slough is that secondary channel, uh, former channel of, of the LA River. And then um, there's numerous creeks, right? We know about our channelized rivers, but you know we used to have creeks as well. And, um, and so there's squiggly creeks and at least one of them lives on in, in a park name, uh, Boughton Creek Park. Uh, over off of Atherton and Bellflower. And then various water bodies, the uh, seasonal lakes and ponds. And then this other important thing, which is the reason for the contours around Signal Hill, which is the Newport Inglewood Fault Zone, which as the name suggests, goes from Newport Beach to Inglewood, uh, kind of slicing across the LA Basin at a diagonal and slicing Long Beach in half at a diagonal and creating the uplift um, that gives us our, uh, well, Signal Hill itself, but also some of our neighborhood names that um, refer to hills like Bixby Knolls and Los Altos and uh, Alamitos Heights and so on. And um, so that's the 1896 map. So I'm gonna back all these layers off. And, and so you can see you know, this, this list on the left are all these different layers um, the city within its, you know, city GIS has over 200 of them, but the ones that I'm showing uh, here today are lots of custom historic layers. And so, um, oh, I remember, uh, with, with these basic features of um, the rivers and the fault zones, it kind of divides the natural landscape of Long Beach into a couple different sections. So the area to the southwest of the Signal Hill uplift and east of the Los Angeles River. This is called the Long Beach Plain. And then uh, to the northeast of the Signal Hill uplift and between the rivers is what's known as the Downey Plain. But the, um, the section where the river flows through the uplift because the river was actually flowing here prior to the fault being active and, and causing a rise in the land. And as, as the land was rising, the river was cutting through it and creating a gap in the uplift because over here is Dominguez Hill, you know, which is a continuation of the fault and, and the, the ridge line of Signal Hill. So this area uh, is, is known as Dominguez Gap, which, you know, of course, there's a Dominguez Gap wetlands and a, a, a habitat restoration there. So we know that name. But down here is also a gap where the uh, San Gabriel River cut through the Signal Hill uplift. Um, and since it's so close to the shoreline, the, um, the former Alamitos Bay estuary occupies the space, and this is called the Alamitos Gap. So these gaps and ridge lines and plains are the kind of forgotten natural feature names of, of Long Beach. You know, now they are replaced by neighborhoods and freeways and streets and so on. The oldest uh, street in Long Beach that predates the, um, the foundation of the city is Anaheim Road, which was the road that you took to get from Wilmington to Anaheim. And it crossed Long Beach, you know, starting in the 1850s, long before uh, the city was founded. 
So skipping ahead to the founding of the city, I mean, there's a lot, lot more I could be saying about all this in between stuff, um, but we're, we're trying to get to Willow Springs uh, directly. But Long Beach was founded in 1882, but not by that name. It, it was founded uh, being called the American Colony, and it was mostly 20 acre farm lots. And uh, the town site um, was laid out with this street grid, but it was called Wilmore City after the guy who was, who was developing the American colony. And so Wilmore City and the American colony only lasted for a couple of years before the name was changed to Long Beach. But when it was laid out in 1882, they had to go to a certain spot to secure a water supply for the founding of the city. And that spot was right in here because actually when I describe the, um, the gaps, there's one more gap that is very obscure and we're gonna reveal it tonight. Um, I mentioned the Dominguez Gap where the LA River is cutting through the uplift and the Alamitas Gap where the San Gabriel River cut through the uplift. Well, when I zoom in here, there is a much smaller gap. And you can see the top of Signal Hill, the, the ridge line extending to the Northwest and there's a blue line creek that cuts through this ridge line. And creeks don't normally cut through ridge lines. And what this actually means, and I was able to look in some, you know, uh, Southern California uh, geological uh, studies from uh, the 1950s. This was also a river uh, flowing on a flat plain um, before the uplift occurred or began to occur starting at about 120,000 years ago. And this river was cutting through the uplift as it was happening, you know, because an uplift happens like a, a millimeter of upward motion every year. So it's very, very slow and a, a waterway can cut through it uh, with no problem. And so this waterway had this S-shaped meander in it. Um, that's the S-shaped meander was a, a river flowing on a flat plain. And then as the uplift occurred, the S-shaped meander cut through it. And then at some point, the river changed course and went somewhere else, joined the LA River, the San Gabriel River. And then the uplift kept happening. And so this went from what's known as a water gap to a wind gap because the, the water had already carved the notch um, the gulch through the uplift, but then um, the uplift continued to carry it up, even though there wasn't a river in it. And what we're actually seeing here, because these these uh, symbols uh, are uh, indicate freshwater wetlands, we're seeing um, an artesian spring breaking through the layers behind the fault line and uh, turning into surface water again, because, you know, what is the source of this blue line creek? It's just coming from these wetlands and, and there isn't anything further. It's not coming from the mountains, although it is uh, in the form of subterranean water. So this creek is coming from a crack in the fault line that connects it to an underground aquifer that has its recharge area in the foothills. And so basically the ancient stream that carved the, the notch in the uplift um, is continuing to carry water and then it comes to the surface here and, um, and flows through. So in 1882, the people that founded what became Long Beach tapped into that artesian spring and it became the you know, dedicated secure water source uh, for the development of Long Beach. And it lasted it for quite some time before the, the spring was tapped out and they reverted to other wells. So I'm going to turn on this um, 2010 map again, just to give you a close, more close up sense of, of where we're at. So, you know, the way we orient ourselves in, in a modern city is this is the 405 freeway. And then this is Spring Street and Willow Street. This is Sunnyside Cemetery. And then California Avenue on the west and Orange Avenue on the east. And so what's now known as Willow Springs Park is this, um, now it's 48 acre uh, city owned property that has been owned by the city uh, ever since the 
founding of Long Beach, essentially, because it was the city's water source until the 1920s. So in the 1920s, and we're coming up, this is, this is the month, actually, um, of the 100th anniversary of the discovery of oil on um, Signal Hill, which happened in June 1921. Um, but the other thing that was going on in June of 1921 is the city was planning a great park um, to uh, take into account the city's waterlands. And I'm gonna turn on a more detailed map of the city's waterlands in 1922. And I'm gonna have to figure these layers so that we can see it better. Even turning this one off. Here, let me zoom in all the way. So this is a completely different map, but the S-shaped meander is, is very apparent in here. Let me turn this fully on. So we can see that same S shape that we saw before. And by 1922, the spring had been turned into a reservoir, a concrete reservoir, and that reservoir still exists um, at, at Willow Springs. Um, and then this is the, the top of the local hill. Um, you know, we, we have Signal Hill, but here is a hill that at this time was referred to as Reservoir Hill because there was also a reservoir on top of it. And you can see the contour lines. So the, the stream would flow through the spring had been right here where the reservoir was created, and then the spring flowed through to uh, connect with the Cerritos Slough. So in um, 1922, they called this the city waterlands. Oh, this is 1921. And so check out the things that they call out. The marsh, which is uh, freshwater wetlands, um, and the willows are specifically called out. Um, so that artesian spring was uh, gave rise to a riparian uh, habitat, uh, you know, a streamside habitat full of willows and presumably things like mule fat, which we still have there today, and other things that you know no accounting was made of the plants that existed in those early days. So we can only guess based on on what we know um, about the distribution of of native plants. But this is you know the the first early map um, that detailed this site. And then it, it was later turned into a park plan for 200 acres of park. And so in 1921, the city intended to create a new great park uh, with 200 acres, but, and, and the park plan was approved in June, 1921, the same week that oil was discovered on Signal Hill. So the city hesitated and didn't immediately implement its park plan, um, but, and actually, Let's see, I might have this queued up and ready to look at. Did my screen change? Or are you still looking at that 1922 thing? I may have to reshare. It did not change. Okay, let me switch to this. There we go. Yeah, so this is the extent of the 200 acre park and um, David Sundstrom, if you're uh, on the on the call right now, we had no idea 20 years ago that there was a vast park already planned for this site, um, and and you know one of the things that's going through it is a is a railroad. Um, all of these squiggly lines are driving parkways because in 1921, you know, going out for a Sunday drive was a new thing. So not only did they make uh, parkland, but they gave people, uh, made it a destination for people to drive through. Um, so I'm going to uh, jump back to our map. And so I've already, already overrunning my time. So I'm going to jump ahead to, because this is kind of the, the, you know, this is the oldest accurate map that we have of the site, where, which shows the willows and the marsh in place, right? And from here on out, it just gets more developed and those features disappear in, until we are starting to uh, see them reemerge. But here is the same area in 1950. Um, and so this is an aerial photograph that I was able to find and um, add into the GIS where, well, couple of things going on here. 
you can see how oil field activities are dominating the property now. So all of the, the round things are, you know, tank, uh, oil tanks, oil, uh, tank farms. And then the, these things are oil sump or separation ponds. And then the oil rigs themselves, um, since this is a top-down photo, you can't see them, but apparently it was taken in the late afternoon, and so you can see their long shadows. So there were dozens of these um, oil rigs across the property. Oh, and you can see, okay, this is fun. How we can do the, let's try this peel back version. of 1950 where we can we can compare it to 1921 um, whoops so that reservoir uh, on the top of the hill and the reservoir down in the basin both of them still exist the 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 one that I'm my cursor is at is dry at this point because they had abandoned it as a drinking water reservoir in favor of this just being an oil field and then the one at the top of the hill was actually being used for equipment storage. Um, and then, you know, there's actually houses of caretakers and things like that here. Um, the trees that we see are all eucalyptus because those had been planted by the water company. Um, and so that's a, a glimpse of it in 1950. So now let's try 1985. So here it's beginning to change where the oil uses aren't as intense. Um, some of the tank farms have been removed. The derricks have switched to the grasshopper pump jacks. Um, this is an Exxon oil uh, office building that's at the top of the hill. Um, and then, I don't know, this is some sort of uh, oil services yard. But at the time, all of this property is still actually owned by the water department. So the, the water department was leasing out land um, for all of these activities. But you can see vegetation starting to creep back in. By this point, it's all the common invasive species like mustard and tree tobacco and castor bean and uh, Russian, Russian thistle. Um, you know, the, the former native plant uh, landscape has been completely transitioned with a handful of exceptions. And then here we are, let's see what 2013 is going to look like. So jumping ahead to this low res uh, picture of 2013, which is um, incorporating some of the, the restoration areas. And because in 2012, or actually early 2013, a master plan uh, that accommodated um, uh, you know, sustainable plantings and, um, and wetlands restoration was approved by the city council. So, we went from, in 100 years, from a grand park that would have been the largest in the city to an oil field that um, is going to be 100 years old this month um, to the gradual reclaiming of nature, uh, even as the smaller footprint oil field continued to exist there. Um, you know, plants were reasserting themselves. And the, the native plants in particular that um, are reasserting themselves first and foremost, without our help, were willows and mule fat, which are those riparian plants that anywhere where there's water, um, they want to be. And so um, I'll, I'll jump back out here. And I'm going to turn it over to Blanca in the interest of time. But hopefully we'll have uh, time for specific questions, because the, um, the thing that I'm going to show um, right as, whoops, as I turn off these layers, and get ready to pass to Blanca is the Willow Spring watershed. Let's see if that's going to show. So the spring is long gone, but this um, red boundary is the watershed area that um, goes in a storm drain and passes through the site. So when it rains, we get to divert water um, from a storm drain and put it on the ground. And so that's how we're, we're creating a wetlands restoration on this site uh, using stormwater. 
And um, I can give more details about how that all works if, if you come uh, and visit the site and, and, and see it in action. You know, we had water for three months uh, flowing through our bioswales and in our ponding areas, but we also had a light rain winter. And so, um, you know, it, it didn't last as long, um, but a lot, uh, two acre feet of water, that's 600,000 gallons of water soaked into the ground in, in a way where it would have otherwise gone into the ocean. And, and so, hold on, let me. So here's that watershed and uh, the land that it's draining from, um, very industrial, including the freeway. And so we've um, created an opportunity to clean the water through a sand, sand trap filter. And um, I'm going to abruptly change my share to some supplemental images that I threw together. So this is a, an, an image or a, a visualization of what the LA Basin looked like you know, prior to urbanization with um, the, the rivers flowing freely. This was something uh, that was done by an artist at the um, aquarium. Um, this is uh, an aerial view of Willow Springs prior to the restoration. This delineates the restoration area. Um, and then that's a view of the same area in 1928, uh, showing it as an oil field. Um, this is a map that's at Longview Point that was part of the first um, restoration. And, and this is Willow Springs uh, at the height of the oil field. This is what's going on under the surface with the, um, the artesian uh, well that, or spring that was formerly there. Um, and, I won't go into that explanation, but uh, artesian springs and wells are this very specific pressurized thing. And then um, this is uh, w uh, something that I covered that got turned into a sign. And this is where we reveal the name of um, the gap where Willow Springs is um, that we're referring to as Awanga Gap after a nearby Tongva village. And then a, a wide shot of that first restoration area at the top of Longview and a different version of that, um, that image. So I will stop there and um, hand this off to Blanca to talk about now that we've helped create this space and got it back on the path of restoration, the things that we do there and the meaning that it has um, to the people that work and, and visit and the future potential of what else uh, we can get going there. Are you ready, Blanca? I am. Thank you, Larry. I always enjoy hearing you talk about Willow and Long Beach. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen here. So Larry's giving you a really great introduction in the history, the history. And again, as Larry said, we hope that you come out on the 19th so you can hear more about the history and what we are doing now in Willow Springs. So one of the things that brings me joy and our crew joy is restoring relationship to land. And we talk about this all the time in very different ways. And I'm going to hope to present that to you, um, to present that to you all here tonight. So this is one of the images of Willow Springs. This is Longview Point. So the high point um, at our restoration site which was open to the public in 2012. Now, before I even started working at Willow Springs, I used to come and sit under this pepper tree to the left-hand side of your screen um, during my lunch breaks um, at a former jo job site. And I loved this park. I, did, I knew absolutely nothing about it, um, but it was really interesting to come and see you know, native plants growing in an area where you, you couldn't see or find any native plant habitat. So again, 2012 here, this image was taken. Today we are tending to over 200 trees, over 6,000 coastal sage scrub native plants. Just to name a few, we have California sagebrush, white sage and black sage. Buckwheat is doing very, very well um, during this season. 
our bush sunflower is starting to get ready for rest as the summer is approaching. So we are doing what we can to keep them vibrant and alive during these last few weeks of spring. We also have a Southern tar plant. So of course this is a rare plant um, ranked at 1B.1. Um, B and this is a plant that I had never seen in person before working at Willow Springs. And this is an opportunity again for our communities to come out and partake in observing rare plants, um, being educated and sharing with communities around them about the importance of protecting native plants. And we'll go in into that a little bit more. Coyote brush, mule fat again, and of course our Gideonjai black willow as Larry was speaking of earlier. Our cottonwoods are doing really great, um, really great this, season, this year. And our elderberry, our elderberry are finally producing a, a good amount of um, fruit. They are about on their third or fourth year and they are starting to bloom and just spread out um, onto our restoration site. So it's such a beautiful uh, site to see. Willow Springs, this is a shot taken a few years later um, in February, 2021. You can see how the plant habitat here has um, just spread out. Uh, Willow Springs was planted very intentionally um, in patches. And the plants are doing as they do. They are so wise and they are spreading, they are propagating themselves and we are going in and tending to them as needed. So here are some before and after shots. In 2019, we were very active with hosting a number of volunteer events. You can see here, we had speakers out. This was um, a local church group that came out. It was about, about 30 folks all coming out to want to assist. And this is one of our lower ponding areas here. We were clearing out all of the mustard. As many of you know, who have participated in restoration or in any sort of um, you know, native plant um, volunteer work, mustard is one of the plants that takes over a lot of our open lands. So mustard was being removed here and we did such a great job. Today, you can see that these efforts, the efforts that so many have put in along with us, the sweat, the discomfort, all of it um, has done so well, has provided so much support for our native plants here at Willow Springs. So you can see off to the right, today there is very little um, mustard there. Today we had one of our crew members who is on the call today, Natalie, go out there and remove some of that mustard. And these photos are also taken by Natalie, so I want to make sure to give credit where it is deserved. Um, our Cottonwoods have grown and golden bush has taken over this lower ponding area. This golden bush was also spread by hydro seed um, about two years ago. Is that correct, Larry? Give me a thumbs up. Yeah, something like that. Three and a half. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, okay. <laughs> yeah, three and a half. <laughs> and, and the golden bush is just doing great, spreading all over again. Um, and a this is how restoration works, right? We spread the seeds, we put the plants into the earth and little by little, we begin to see those invasive plant plants, <laughs> invasive plants being pushed out. Another shot here to compare spring in 2019. This photo to the right was taken today and you can see the difference within um, the tree growth here. We have our cottonwoods off to the left um, that were just placed into the ground. And then here we are, our cottonwoods are doing fairly, fairly well. Um, we are providing them with water as needed, but they are doing great. Off to the left-hand side, a lot of what you see up on that hillside is mustard or other invasive plants. So today, or on the 19th, when you go visit Willow Springs, you will notice that our native plants have been, again, 
planted in patches and have begun to spread outward. And I am happy to say that mustard is not growing along that hillside. And I'm gonna keep my fingers crossed that I haven't spoken too soon, but um, they are not showing up as much as they were within the last two, three years. Here's another shot, do forgive. Um, it was a really blurry shot on um, one of our profiles here, but this is, you can see the concrete hillside off to the back end if you look carefully. Um, and again, the difference here, right? There is a lot more um, density within our native plant habitat. And also these, these are workshops that we were doing back in 2019 where folks were coming out, getting to meet Willow Springs, getting to hear from different present presenters. We also had the privilege to host um, Chris with CMPS and also um, Tracy Drake. So I'm so excited that y'all are gonna get to hear from her or them next month. But here are some comparisons. So what drives our inspiration and intention? So again, we are very committed to providing a space where folks can come to truly build a relationship um, with the land and also with one another. We want to create a space where folks can come, share their love, their passion, and their interest, their curiosity around native plant and habitat. And there is so much of that. It's just we don't know where to go to to receive and to learn and to share information and knowledge. Um, and this is one of the spaces that we hope to create. Of course, also to restore habitat for native fa local fauna. We have an abundant amount of cottontail rabbits, uh, an abundant amount of birds of prey. Um, we have reptiles and you know, um, coyotes, we've had our coyotes come and go. Um, fortunately, they're not making themselves too visible at this moment. So we are happy for that because they were getting um, a little excited there for a second. Also creating empowering programming specifically for indigenous black and communities of color. This is also something that is very important to us to make sure that folks who have not had the opportunity to access and partake in being in nature to know that this is a, again, programming specifically um, with them in mind. Also creating stewardship training. So we hope to get that started very soon. Uh, we do have um, a program that's going to start soon and we'll speak a little bit more on that in a bit. I Naturalist, we just hosted our first City Nature Challenge and it was such a success. It was a small group of folks, but I tell you, you know, getting folks introduced to I Naturalist, getting them excited about, you know, recording observations, our crew also provided um, our guests with a beautiful zine or, you know, pamphlet that would guide them through the park and encourage them to stop and observe different plants. And also if they caught, you know, if they were lucky enough to catch a cottontail rabbit or other critters, they were also given the opportunity to um, compare and also the encouragement to observe and record through iNaturalist as well. So having local indigenous communities build relationship to land by tending to habitat, education around the effects of dis disconnection to land and the effects of that on mental health, green job training for, site, um, for youth on site, and of course, tending to land and healing. Healing is something that is quite important to me as Chris mentioned um, in the introduction. That is what truly um, called me to native plants is um, the knowing that even just simply sitting with them can be a very healing experience. So native plants at Willow Springs, the native flowers are essential to our habitat. Um, we have, again, the tar plant. We have Datura, who is here on the right-hand side. We have our encilias, the coyote bush is just right behind the datura here as well. So many important and essential native flowers, which provide um, food and shelter for many native insects and animals. 
Many birds and insects have a genetic memory which guides them to the plants which they have depended on for thousands of years. When they do not have access to these plants, uh, populations of native fauna are devastated. So I ask now if you can ask yourself this question, how does this knowing translate to us and to our communities? So awakening the genetic memory within us. We have been exploring the different ways of building relationship and re of reciprocity to the land and to those within our communities. We encourage folks to come out to Willow Springs, one, to build relationship to land, two, to provide access to plant harvesting to indigenous communities. Um, I shared a little bit earlier that this is something that is quite important to us. Many of us that are within the native, native plant communities or conservation or interest in restoration, we are also hearing lots about the land back movement and whatever small act that we can take. And if that means opening our parks, opening um, our lands to indigenous communities to come and be present with native plants, these plants that they have built relationships with for generations, and also to have access to harvesting these plants, gathering seed as well, um, is something that you know we are gently moving forward in, in collaboration with um, a local counseling center here um, in the LA area. So empower youth through art and connection to nature. We are starting to come up with creative ways of how to bring community out to combine all of those different uh, interests, right? We have ideas of music, of art, of murals, um, and also incorporating education around the importance of protecting native plant habitat as we are gathering, exploring, um, our love and appreciation in whichever form it is that we feel called to do. Reminding youth and adults of the relationship they hold within themselves and the genetic memory we carry as BIPOC. Again, we're speaking specifically here about Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Uh, we welcome all folks in, of course, to our park, but we want to be very clear that this is a time when we want to create these spaces where a lot of folks of color have not been given the opportunities due to lack of green spaces within their neighborhoods or also um, lack of accessibility to travel outside of those neighborhoods to access green spaces. So we know that Willow Springs is in, you know, a dense um, populated area. And we want to, again, encourage the, the community that lives within um, Willow Springs to come out and to feel a sense of connection and also a sense of, ownership and stewardship so that they can come out and continue to assist us with protecting. So some of the things that we forget when we do begin to build these relationships and with these with this specific community is that throughout the years, as I have personally sat and tended land with youth and adults, this experience has reminded me of the intergenerational trauma that many of us carry. And many of us carry this intergenerational trauma around a lack of access to land or lack of um, access to traditional knowledge. So when we find ourselves back to land, when we find ourselves sitting next to native plants or any plant in that, at, of that matter, we can begin to, to feel this memory come to us. And I heard so many speak on this, you know, if they smell, for instance, if they smell California sagebrush and they begin to, to remember scents, they begin to re remember connections, right? This reminds me of rosemary and rosemary did this and that for me when I was ill. I drank rosemary at this moment in my life. So these memories become triggered when we begin to intentionally sit, we begin to intentionally smell, touch, observe, and this is again something that we hope to, to provide to our community here. So through this work and through the experience working with different volunteers, 
we also want to be very mindful that when we call in our volunteers, when we call in our internships, when we call folks to co work with us, alongside us um, on these very important projects, we also want to make sure that there are people who look like them and speak like them, right? So we may also have different reasons for this call back to land, and this may be activating for some folks. So when we are out there and we just want to learn all of the botanical names and someone next to us just wants to sit and smell a plant, we have to make sure that we are providing space for everyone. So not pushing communities out that may not want to have interest in particular topics, but opening up opportunities so that we can all learn from one another. We can all empower one another, uplift one another through this interest of native plants and this knowing of wanting to be out in nature. So as we move our bodies in this work, it be physically pulling out mustard or it be just walking a trail, we do awaken a memory. And that memory can sometimes be very joyous. It can be very healing, but sometimes it can also bring um, memories of frustration or sadness. So keep that in mind when we are all out there, when we are all out there working with one another in this protection and in this movement that as long as we make space for everyone, as long as we create a, a space where folks can explore and be free and um, observe and record as they wish, it be through iNaturalist or it be through a journaling project or it be through art, um, that we are empowering our communities. And when they feel empowered, they're going to continue to come back and they're going to do the work for the future generations, right? And that is our big hope here, is that this park is so young. This park is four years old as, you know, people have been coming in and out. We are starting to see families come out. We are starting to see more folks walk the trail. And that is something that brings me joy. We stop, we greet them, we hand them an informational pamphlet or a zine, and it just builds this really beautiful connection. Um, you know, just recently we had this couple who was coming through and um, one of the individuals was pregnant and they just had their baby. So a few days ago, you know, we're all driving in the truck trying to get to one of the work sites and we get to meet this newborn baby that had been walking that trail for, uh, who knows, I, I think it was the full, you know, pregnancy if, in my understanding. And those are the relationships we wanna build, right? That, you know, the parents were sharing with us that they're gonna bring their kid to this park you know, every week and they're going to make sure that they know the park and they're going to make sure that they respect the park and build relationship with the plants. And that is why we do this work. That is why we are out there, you know, um, in the heat, during the rain, sweating, sometimes very uncomfortable. But when we make those connections and we can build those relationships, it is also worth it because we want to make sure that that young child continues to come to Willow Springs and continues to help us in the protection of native plant habitat. So gratitude here. So this is why it is essential to me and our crew and the work that we do here at Willow Springs through our connection to native plants, we connect to the ancestors of the land. We build relationships of reciprocity. We tend to the land that heals us and provides us uh, with a space where folks can learn about ecology, about deep observations and so much more. I would like to thank all of the interns that have come and gone, all the volunteers that have shared their energy with us and to the land for allowing us to gently learn. We are not here to manage or control the land. We are simply here to be present with the land as we tend to the land. So that is for me. Thank you all. And I believe uh, we'll have some time for questions if there are any. Wow, thank you. Uh, what a great presentation. Um, such a, a full circle um, from the beginning of what what would be called Willow Springs to now and into the future and uh, of this amazing place in the center of the city. 
Um, this could easily have been something else, right? Like an industrial park. And so I just want to say thank you both for the work that you do and providing this, this space for the community. Um, we do have time for questions, uh, comments, um, as well as uh, if, if Larry, uh, if people ask Larry to share more pictures uh, or GIS, um, we have plenty of time for, for both of you to answer questions. So is there any questions out there? Um, I see Larry, uh, you shared a link. Yeah, so this is the link to the online, um, almost equivalent, but not quite as good as my thing. But anyway, um, and and if you allow, I'll uh, I'll share my screen and kind of walk you through how it works real quick. Um, see if that's gonna work. Okay, so the the link that I provided when you go there, you this is where you land in New Orleans. But all you have to do is type in any place. Because the cool thing about this is this is most of the United States, but we can just go into Long Beach. And so theirs is a little bit different, where they start with that base map. But you click and look at that Willow Springs, well represented here. Um, you click on the map to let it know uh, where you're at and or, you know, the specific area that you're interested in. And so then here's the timeline of all the different US geological survey maps that you can bring into this. So the one that's the equivalent to the one that I was showing is, is this one, uh, Downey 1896. And so um, you, so we'll, let's try to pan around in here. I guess double clicking doesn't zoom. Um, but you can, with this bar, you can um, fade it back, right? So, um, so you can, you know, go anywhere uh, in Southern California. Although you have to keep adding the map that you want. So, if you we wanted to look at, um, you know, Machado Lake, you'd have to go to the Redondo Quad. And back then, they're calling it Bixby Slough. But then, yeah, it gives you, you know, pieces of uh, PV Peninsula and the Wilmington Lagoon. So, you know, you can go around and do all of this, but then you can also, you know, I just went back to the oldest map. Um, you can do maps that are more recent. So I got to go back to this and let's pick, oh, not that one. That was a bad choice, sorry. That's a, uh, for zooming out, we have to keep an eye on this co this thing here. So the this color, the, the blue is a wider scale map, but this is the more detailed one. So this is the one that I wanted, 1949. And so here when you, and how do you zoom in? Oh, here we go. So this is 1949. So just as you know, the suburbs uh, of East Long Beach are being developed, um, and over at Willow Springs, come on. We're gonna see. Oh, this is interesting. So this is the top of the hill with the reservoir. This is the reservoir that's in the gulch. It's actually showing little um, bodies of water that are probably collected stormwater in 1949 and then the tank farms and you can you can still see the the stream that used to lead out of there and flowed into uh, this is where Memorial Hospital is now but in 1949 they're still referring to this spot as Willowville which is a whole other story but anyway that's that's a quick glimpse and so the the link to this website um, livingatlas.arcgis.com is in, is in the chat. So that's a quick demonstration of that and happy to um, take any other questions. Great, Larry. Um, I see some comments that storm drains and street runoff also sustain the Gardino Willows wetland, which has at least a one year round pond. Um, right. Uh, there's a question where is the warehouse complex being built right now located? And if you could uh, 
explain that? Oh, sure. So that, you know, the the blocks or the streets that bound um, Willow Springs, you know, it's California on the west, spring on the north, and orange on the east, and uh, 48 acres of city-owned property falls within that. There's an additional seven and a half acres at the corner of um, spring and orange that are privately owned, and they're unfortunately currently being developed into warehouse buildings. And so that little corner of Willow Springs property is carved out and going to be developed. But the little bit of, of good news associated with that is that the developer is paying for two and a half acres of restoration work inside of the park uh, to buffer their development. So, um, you know, because the way that this, this restoration on the 48 acres is working is that we have to go after uh, grant funding. So the, the wetlands project was funded by a state of California grant um, that got us to the that and, and, and some other you know, smaller grants got us to the 16 acres that have been actively restored so far, but there's still 32 acres that need to be restored and we need to go after um, outside funding sources to get them, uh, to, to get funding for, for those areas. But this two and a half acres around the uh, development site are being funded by the developer. So it's small consolation. Great. Um, Doug asks, how is the stormwater cleaned? Okay, so if you, you come, you can see this in person, but within that concrete basin, we have a sand filter. So <laughs> the water that we divert from the storm drain um, goes and soaks through the sand, uh, like 18 inches of sand. And this was like expensive sand that was purchased that's engineered for this exact purpose. And then a filter fabric, uh, so like a thick piece of felt. So it, you know, it doesn't clean out every last thing, but it reduces the pollutant load uh, by 90% that passes through that. And then it um, gets pumped into a, a bioswale, flows through the park into our ponding area. So the water that ends up in the ponding area, which is our wetland restoration area, and ultimately soaks into the ground has been um, cleaned significantly through this um, sort of natural system. Awesome. Uh, lots of praise in there. Um, so feel free to check those comments out. There's a question for Blanca. Uh, where did you build your expertise in sharing traditional knowledge? Were there sources or other conserved areas or nature centers that helped you on your journey? Mm, that's a great question. Um, my traditional knowledge comes from um, elders that live in Mexico. So my ancestors are from Mexico, uh, the Purapecha and Chichemeca people. Um, so that is where my traditional knowledge comes. I want to be very clear of that. But um, through different connections and different communities within like the LA area, um, a lot of yeah, folks interested in environmental justice and things of that sort. So there was a lot of folks who would come together and talk about the challenges that they had within their communities, the lack of access to plants. Um, and fortunately, sometimes we would be able, be able to have elders come through and speak to us about <clears throat> different traditional knowledge around healing and how it is that we could access, you know, even the smallest portion of green space and still be able to um, tend to ourselves and and tend to that small piece of, of land that we have access to, right? So um, I think it's just also a matter of going out and sitting and um, listening. You know, many of us know that we can feel joy when we sit next to particular plants. Uh, so begin to observe that, begin to record that. Um, and you will find that within your cycle and with the cycles within the plants, you'll begin to see uh, a relationship build there. And um, I encourage you if you're local to come out to um, Willow Springs and I'm more than happy to, you know, provide you with a small area that you can weed all the invasives out of and then sit and observe and listen and smell and uh, we can go from there. Great. Uh, another question from Adela. Are you planting native hosts and food plants for butterflies?
Wonka, I'm waiting for you to take that one. <laughs> Are you? I'll repeat it. Are you planting yeah. native hosts and food plants for butterflies? Yes, we are. Yeah, we have. Um, we've just started propagating our uh, milkweed, our narrow leaf milkweed. So we are getting some milkweed out and also um, many other perennials. Right. And yeah, but we do. We have a, an abundant amount of plants that we have propagated in what we call like our seed garden, um, different buckwheats and sages, um, clarkia, uh, so many. And for some reason, I'm drawing blanks. But yes, uh, we do intentionally are starting to plant for butterfly gardens. Great. Uh... Another question, maybe for Larry on maps. Are the maps available for the public to see uh, a historical society? Is there a chance to connect Willow Springs to the LA River via a green space? Um, so I, I shared the link for some of those historic maps, particularly the US Geological Survey ones, which are quite a few of them. The, the more unique ones aren't, aren't really available um, for the public, but uh, Birgit, you can reach out to me um, and I'll, I'll put my email in the chat as well if um, there's some something in particular that you're interested in seeing. Um, and then, yeah, they're, they're well, in, in my world of sustainability, there's a big intention to make green connections between all of the open spaces. Um, but that is a, a long-term effort. Um, and, and so, you know, there's not a specific easy way to make a connection between Willow Springs and the LA River. However, the storm drain pipe connects Willow Springs and the LA River. And of course it's, it's buried. So until a time when we can um, daylight that storm drain and have a, a surface flowing stream along it, um, th that'll take some doing, but, um, you know, the water that we divert from the storm drain that, that um, we use in the restoration areas, I mean, that would have become uh, LA River water. And so, um, you know, we're, we're borrowing that and cleaning it and, you know, growing a riparian habitat instead of letting it get into the LA River and, and go straight into the ocean. So we're, we're kind of the the watershed that's upstream from the LA River. So there's definitely a connection, even if there isn't a, a direct surface connection for, for walking uh, between the two spaces. Thank you. Um, Victoria asks, what kind of irrigation systems or methods do you use? So I'll start off with that and then Blanca can. Uh, so the restoration area was installed with, um, and the patches, you know, Blanca mentioned the, the restoration strategy of planting patches. Irrigation was installed to point inward at those patches to, to make it sort of water efficient. But for the most part, the irrigation isn't on and uh, Blanca through their work, um, selectively turns on uh, irrigation in, in certain areas that look like uh, it, it needs it. But for the most part, things are established and operating without irrigation and plants are expanding into the areas that aren't irrigated at all, which is you know what the restoration strategy is all about. Blanca, do you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, there are areas of the park that um, have not intentionally been planted at all, and we are slowly starting to move within those directions. So when we do plant in these in newer areas, we are actually doing a lot of hand watering. So we're taking out five gallon containers and we are walking them to those plants and making sure that they get water. Um, but we're hoping that within you know the next year, uh, we will not have to do that. And Regina Taylor asks, how many more acres will be available when cement, quote unquote, processing is completed? So there's a existing business on the on the property uh, called Hanson Aggregate, and it's a concrete recycling um, activity, um, and it takes up about four acres. And so that will probably be the last thing to go. Like we, we need to secure funding 
um, to restore the area that the cement processing plant is on before it goes because it pays rent to the city. Um, so th that'll be a while, but it's uh, four acres of the 48 that we'll get back when, when that happens. Great, lots of good questions. Um, and a reminder that we are having the walk on June 19th. So please email us if you wanna sign up. Um, one more question here. Besides developer mitigation funds, what other financing sources are available and for how long into the future? Right, so the there's county measure A, there's um, there's you know state open space uh, bonds that we can apply for grants to, uh, which is one of the ways that we got funding for for the you know the 12 acre wetland project. There's the Rivers and Mountains Conservancy, uh, which is a more local funding source uh, that we've applied to. But more recently, there is Measure W, which is the Clean Safe Water Act that everyone who pays property tax pays a little bit extra. And so we have um, uh, application that's being prepared uh, to restore another 14 acres using Measure W. So there, there's a bunch of different things, but you know, we, we have to uh, put in grant applications into very com competitive spaces because everyone's figured out that this is where the, you know, the, the types of open space that you can get money for is, native habitat and specifically wetland restoration. So there's a lot of demand on that. Uh, another question, years ago when Johnson was council member, there was talk if of a visitor center in the north side, is that off the table? So in that master plan, there was a visitor center called out along Orange. Um, we tried to um, get something going there when we moved a historic building back in 2015 that was going to be a combination historic preservation and adaptive reuse visitor center. Unfortunately, that building burned down before it was completed in 2016. So there is an effort to um, replace that building with a pavilion structure. And so we'll have a visitor center, but it won't be, it's, it's full availability as a visitor center is something that's gonna have to be phased in because initially it's gonna be um, uh, more, more like a shade pavilion. Thank you. And uh, any more questions from the participants here? that aren't in the chat. I don't think I missed any questions specifically for Larry or Blanca, but feel free I, to I, unmute yourself. I have a question for, yeah. uh, for uh, Blanca and Larry. What are they doing to contact the Boy Scouts in Long Beach, Long Beach Area Council on 37th Street to let them know that service is needed and that the scouts can help them and various troops will help. Uh, if they don't know about it, you're not gonna get help from scouts. Right, so scouts, uh, so the, the place that scouts often reach out to is the El Dorado Nature Center in, in the Eastern part of Long Beach. And since they have limited capacity to take on lots of scout projects, they routinely refer the scouts to us at Willow Springs. And um, we haven't had any takers yet for whatever reason. I don't know why. At least one uh, you know, Eagle Scout has come out and we've talked about a project, but we didn't see them again. And then the uh, just last month, um, a, a whole group of scouts were referred to us and, and so far haven't followed through. So I don't know if you have any pressure you'd like to apply. <laughs> On them, but um, it's I. I happen to be active in in the council, uh, the scout, the troop, the Order of the Arrow, so I might be able to uh, have some influence on the various troops. Yeah, I don't. I don't know if what they see there isn't their idea of a place that they would like to work, um, or what exactly is going on, because it's you know a kind of a non-traditional space, right? It, it's got this post-industrial feel to it that you know we're in in the process of transitioning to something more natural, and and so plenty of other people can you know appreciate that situation, but not the scouts so much yet. 
Yeah, hopefully, Albertus, you could put a little pressure on those scouts um, or just put them on a bus and drop them off at the park. And I'm sure Blanca and, and Larry can get them to work there. Shovel in hand. Any other questions or comments out there? Just feel free to unmute yourself. And, uh, oh, I hear someone. I hear someone. Yeah, I had a question. Go for it, Regina. Taylor. Okay. Uh, it was the one I tried to type in, didn't do too well, but that construction going on at the north end, if you go by it, it it's salacious and it's very, very deep. And I'm just wondering, considering all the water flow that has occurred there over the years, uh, how much impact is that having on the soil, the availability of the water to flow in the original channels? Um, I don't believe there was an EIR done on it, but I may be wrong. For Larry, I guess, would be the yeah. best person to answer that. You know, that, that bit of private property that's getting the warehouse. Private property that's getting the warehouse. Oh, Regina, can you mute? Oh, I'm sorry. There we go. Um, the warehouse buildings that are currently having their site work done prior to the buildings going up, they all, all the on-site runoff is going to be directed into the storm drain that's in that flows through the site uh, underground, and it's a huge nine-foot diameter storm drain. All of their runoff is going into that, and that's what goes into that central basin that we are able to divert water from. So the you know the natural flow of water on that property, at least that northern half of the property that you're referring to was altered and disturbed long ago. There, there's nothing natural about the way that it flows now, but luckily we have access to that storm drain and th that's where we get the water out of to um, for the wetland restoration areas. So the, the runoff from that development is gonna, at least in part, gonna end up in our restoration, even though it's not flowing on the surface. Thank you, Larry. Uh, another question popped in from David Sundstrom. Where was that incredible 1922 park master plan hiding all these years? So David, I found it in a forgotten storeroom at the old city hall that's uh, in the process of being torn down. Um, there was this outside storeroom that we're using as a, a garden storeroom and it had rolls and rolls of old plans in it that I was going through little by little. And one day I was going through and unrolled this plan that hadn't seen the light of day, presumably since it was put on a shelf in 1922, because it, it didn't exist in any other publication or reference that, you know, because I had been doing lots of research on Willow Springs for years and years. And it just, I was the random person that looked in the storeroom where this thing was. And so it was pretty amazing. Wow. That is amazing. Um, any other questions? Last call on questions from the audience. Anything from Larry and Blanca? We do want to thank you. Uh, that was a really great presentation. I appreciate it. Um, it will be put up on YouTube if people want to watch it later. Um, great mapping and, and great uh, information from Blanca. Um, there was a comment from Alex Duran that if anybody has pictures of residential landscaping with California natives to email him um, at highway162 at gmail.com. So it's in the chat. And lots of thanks from the audience to both of you. Uh, appreciate you all. Uh, next month, we will have Tracy Drake on July 5th, uh, Monday at 7.30. And your other presenter, David, will be here with Lots of jokes and jokes and jokes. So um, hopefully we see you all then. Sign up for our newsletter if you want more information and uh, check out our newsletter on the website. Anybody else, anything else? Otherwise have a great night and uh, sleep well. <laughs>